Mayor Emanuel is ratcheting up spending on campaign ads aimed at African-American voters and announced plans to remove 50 red light cameras on the south and west sides, with polls showing challenger Jesus Chuy Garcia and the mayor neck and neck, and the election less than a month away, many question the timing of it all. Politicians are politicians. They say anything to get a vote. Based on, you know, what he's done for those communities and the fact that he's doing it right around election time, I think, you know, there will be a lot of skeptical people that will look past it. A legal battle is brewing over Governor Rauner's executive order to end so-called fair share union fees. Attorney General Lisa Madigan wants the case thrown out of federal court, claiming the governor does not have legal authority to change that law. Chicago Bulls guard Derrick Rose is getting more than rest after his latest knee injury. A local artist has created a shrine off the Kennedy Expressway where fans can come and pray for a quick recovery for the Bulls star. And to talk about all of this and more, we are joined by Hermine Hartman, publisher of Indigo Media, James Tiendwa, contributing columnist for In These Times magazine, and Kathleen Murphy, director of communications for the Illinois Opportunity Project. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a huge week, and we are in the frenzied last weeks of this runoff election. So let's get started here. Uh, former mayoral candidate Willie Wilson has put his coveted support behind Jesus Chuy Garcia, who has also gained endorsements from uh, Congressman Danny Davis, Reverend Jesse Jackson, former says Senate President Emil Jones. Hermine, how big a factor are all these endorsements? Well, I think Willie Wilson got 50,000 votes. And uh, I don't think they were purely his votes. I think a lot of it was protest voting. Uh, I think it's very significant that uh, Reverend Jackson, Annie Mill Jones, and Congress Congressman Davis uh, have endorsed Chewy. Uh, they are substantial leaders uh, in the black community, and I think people hear and listen to them. How much of those endorsements do translate into votes, James? It's hard to tell. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that uh, candidates, especially losing candidates, have that much sway uh, over their voters. But nevertheless, it's significant, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, 50,000 people voted for, uh, for Will Wilson. And, um, you know, maybe a number of those folks will look for direction from him. But fundamentally, it comes down to how Chuy Garcia can uh, really speak to the uh, yearning of folks. Folks really want... Uh, uh, a, a politics in Chicago that's responsive to their needs. Uh, we haven't had that in the last, you know, not just with this administration, but in previous administrations. Uh, the issue of jobs, the issue of, you know, really good living wage jobs, uh, education, you know, cl closing down 50 schools is really atrocious, uh, especially without the kind of input that neighborhoods, community folks need to have. And so I think there's a backlash over these policies that have been top down, that have completely excluded uh, the public voice. Mayor Emanuel also did get some support mm -hmm. this week in terms of finances, uh, more than a million dollars from Ken Griffin and some other very wealthy donors, and he's raised ten times as much money as his challenger, Chewy Garcia. Kathleen, how big a factor has money been in this race, and will that change over the next four weeks? Well, I think um, money is, of course, always a factor in, in campaigns. But I think Rahm Emanuel has a challenge on his hands. I mean, people don't like him. He, he came into Chicago as this, you know, this tough talk. He was going to clean up the daily administration messes. He's going to, you know, he's going to make the hard decisions. And instead, you know, we have, things have, if they haven't gotten worse, he punted on the issues. Right now, Chicago leads the nation in violent crimes. We're going to send 400,000 students into a school system that will fail to bring 60% of them to grade level achievement by June. Fiscally, uh, we're in a pressure cooker. We were just downgraded to two levels above uh, junk bond status um, two weeks ago. The mayor says these are problems he's inherited. They're, well, they're not problems that have gotten worse under his watch. So um, I, I don't know that he's inherited them, but he certainly hasn't solved them. Barbara, one of the things I want to point out uh, in, in, in the elections is I call it Mr. Apathy 1. More people are not voting. The majority of people are not voting than are voting. And I think that is, a, that is an issue for all politicians, mm -hmm. is how do we get people to vote? How do we raise the consciousness of people to understand how important voting is? Money is important. There's no doubt about money being important. But it is not the most important, important thing. That money is not necessarily going to get that 70% of people who didn't vote. Uh, to the polls. And I think what people are looking for, as I look at these commercials, 
they are attack dog commercials and bulldog mm -hmm. commercials and all that. People are looking for who can unite, who can bring us all together and solve the problems and, and bring some solutions. Crime is a problem in the city of Chicago no matter where you are. You cannot have people sitting in their living room, looking at TV, playing with their grandchildren, getting killed. That's out. Mm -hmm. Who can solve that problem? These red lights, I understand they're up and they're there for money, but you want to be able to drive your car and not pay for what might be a trivial uh, mm -hmm. violation. You hit on two uh, things. Know, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree that you know, apathy is a problem, and uh, we, there's a tendency to blame voters for not voting. Mm -hmm. But what that does is just gets politicians off the hook, right. because they're not creating the necessary right. you know, environment, a welcoming environment for voters to participate. They need to be serious about creating right. jobs. They need to be serious about living wage jobs. Right. You know, and just stop these gimmicks, you know, the mm -hmm. traffic, the red light stuff is a way to avoid taxing rich people. You tax wealth, LaSalle Street, the you know, transa financial transaction tax. There is a slew of ways to raise, to generate revenue. Traffic enforcement, this hyper traffic enforcement has become a way to avoid the serious question of who do you tax to generate revenue for the city? Well, and it's also important to note that despite millions of dollars that have gone into Rahm Emanuel's campaign commercials, he hasn't moved the needle. This race is in a statistical dead heat. And mm -hmm. he does. Chuy Garcia does appeal to the disaffected voters in Chicago. He's got the progressive grassroots behind him. And Rahm Emanuel has, you know, the Lakeshore liberals and the corporate set. And there's, <clears throat> I'm sorry, way more um, disaffected voters in Chicago than there are people who can write five and six figure checks to Rahm Emanuel. You mentioned those ads and, and uh, we saw this week one of the first new attack ads of this runoff election. Let's take a quick look. So do you have any specific thoughts on where you'll get those funds. We continue to do our research to crunch numbers, look at potential revenue sources. But you don't the ad by the Emanuel campaign portrays Chuy Garcia as someone uncertain this, about the city's uh, finances. Mr. Garcia has yet to put out his financial plan that's expected later this week. But Hermine, is this an effective strategy for the mayor? I think not. I think people want to hear unite the city. People want to hear solutions. You close 50 schools, what do you do with 50 buildings? Um, uh, you, you've, you've got the, uh, the red lights up, you just took 20 of them down. We want to hear solutions. Uh, one of the things, one of the candidates, Bill Wall, who just ran for mayor, pointed out is that there are two Chicago's. Uh, one downtown and one in neighborhoods. People want to hear business development. How do we put commerce uh, in some of the poor communities in the city of Chicago and make those communities thrive? The Where mayor, are the jobs? Not the short-term jobs, not the red line jobs, but the career-oriented jobs. That's what people are really looking for. The mayor did talk about that a bit this week. He has an idea for a right to thrive zone in impoverished neighborhoods where he would uh, businesses would pay no property tax or sales tax if they created jobs and they would also get help wading through the city's red tape to establish these businesses. Is this a good idea? Is this a way for the mayor to rehabilitate his image in some of the communities that... For, for, I think, first of all, if the mayor was really serious about the issue of incomes in this, country, in this, in this city, he should have gone with the $15 proposed minimum wage. That's what the city council was deciding, was debating actually. He came in and said, no, no, it's going to be $13, and then he, he delays it. It doesn't kick in until 2019. Now he's running ads as a kind of a champion of the minimum wage. He fundamentally belongs to the wing of the Democratic Party that is now uh, so captive to corporate interests that they can't even champion the minimum wage anymore in a serious kind of way. And I think people are reacting to this, that uh, Democrats like him tend to embrace progressive populist politics uh, uh, during elections, and then the govern as conservatives, uh, patter, pandering and catering to the uh, business elites in this city. So, so I think that's that's what you're seeing from voters who now say, you know, you don't govern this way. All of a sudden, you know, he's on TV with black children. The black community does not need a photo op, you know, public relations sort of strategy from the mayor. They need the real deep, uh, uh, you know, policies that really uh, engage their needs and their interests. The African-American community is so key in this race. What will it take for Mayor Emanuel to win hearts and minds there, Hermine? Solutions. Uh, I think the thrive uh, to work, I think that's good. But 
there's a deeper problem than paying the taxes. It's what about the contracts? It's what about opening up your doors to go into business? Uh, one of the toughest problems that minorities have in going into business is getting money to go into business, is getting that first dollar, those, those, that, that first million dollars that you need in order to open up your doors. That's, in, that's very important. I hope for Mary Manuel, it's not too late. I hope it's not, uh, you're doing maybe some things now that you should have done uh, some years ago uh, in your administration and it's not too late. And again, I think it's important. Who can unite this city? Who can bring this entire city together? I think that's really where, where the guts of the campaign lies. Yeah. We talked a little bit about finances and on Friday, Jesus Chuy Garcia says he will release his economic plan for the city. It's something that a lot of people, including Mayor Emanuel, have pressed him on. Uh, he's made promises to put more police officers on the streets, and uh, which will obviously co cost money. Um, we'll hear hopefully from him how he plans to pay for all of this. How much will this matter to voters, Kathleen? What do they need to hear? I think it should matter to voters quite a bit. The city is actually facing um, a, a pension payment in 2016 mm. for $557 million. That's going to drastically impact budgets. And I actually haven't heard either candidate really articulate how they're going to fund that or put mechanisms in place to reform that. So I, I think that that, I'm very interested to hear what his plan is. But I, I also think that people don't really understand what that means. Mm -hmm. That pension money is teachers, it's policemen, it's city workers, it's firemen, and that their pension. My question is, where did the money go? If we take money out of your check for 20, 30 years to put in a pension fund, and then when it's time for you to collect the pension money, it's gone. Now, in the world I live in, they call that theft. That's called who stole the money. Mm -hmm. Where is the money? I think that's a fundamental question that needs to be answered. Chicago is on, and I think it was uh, Bruce Rauner, Governor Rauner, who pointed this out, we're on the brink of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they threaten, you know, we might, I think Senator Kirk did something, is that we might be matching uh, Detroit. That's very real. That is not, uh, that is not fabrication. That is very, that is very real. And I think uh, the mayor, as well as Chewy, both candidates have to come out and say where money is going and where money is coming. I'm perplexed as to how do we build $60 million parks how do we talk about building a school for Barack Obama, $60 million on the north side? And we're talking about going into right on the edge of bankruptcy. Those are things that you take off the table because obviously we can't afford them. You mentioned to Governor Rauner, and we'll switch gears here for a moment. There's a legal battle heating up over the governor's power to eliminate so-called fair share fees mm -hmm. that non-union workers pay to unions because their workers may earn the same wage or reap the same benefits. Uh, the governor signed an executive order eliminating those fair share fees. Lisa Madigan is now asking that the case be thrown out of court because the attorney general says the governor does not have this kind of power. So when is an executive order, James, not an executive order? Well, you know, what's, what's surprising to me is that I, I thought Republicans didn't like takers, you know, the people who get stuff for free. Fair share says if you are benefiting from a contract that's being negotiated on your behalf, mm -hmm. whether or not you voted for a union, the law requires that you, you, you benefit from that. You know, the employer is not going to say, well, you know, the union negotiated, this is going to go, is, is just going to benefit those who voted for the union. Everybody benefits from that. So a fair share just says, you know what, you're getting something here from, from the collective bargaining process, and, uh, you know, you pay uh, agency fee to cover that, is to cover the cost of, you know, of the bureaucracy that goes into running a union. And all of a sudden, the Republicans are saying it's okay for somebody to benefit from a union contract without actually putting anything in it. But this is part of a, a, an, an attack on unions that is seeking to have a, a, a kind of democracy in Chicago, and for that matter, in this country, where we, we, we disable an important element, an important pillar of this very delicate balance, this delicate democracy. If unions go... We're, it's going to be uh, the Koch brothers and uh, GOP mayors and governor running the country without the benefit of a real contestation where workers' voice uh, Jump in uh, here, compete. Kathleen. Well, I just, I'm, 
that the argument assumes that every contract is a good contract and that every one that's covered underneath the contract it does in fact benefit from it but that's not always the case say you're um, a, a, an exceptional exceptional teacher you should be you know receive a pay raise that's in accordance with your superior performance that doesn't happen under a union um, pay guidelines Say you're a new mom and you want a more flexible work schedule under you know rigid union rules about hours, that doesn't necessarily happen. So the point, the, what the bottom line is, people who don't want to be in a union shouldn't have to pay to be a part of it. Shouldn't, and if you're not in the union, you also this should, is nothing to do with that. This is a, this is a power you. play. This is a power play designed to pave the way for corporate control, corporate hegemony without the benefit of a real contestation, political contestation there are thoughts, from labor unions. There are thoughts, too, What's with it? Wisconsin just becoming a right-to-work state that, yeah. that maybe... And the data, the data, the data right. this, is, this, is settled, this is a settled debate. The data on how right-to-work states are doing, how people in the right-to-work states are doing is clear. That's not, you, you know, don't take it from me. Look at the data on every important in, in index of life, you know, uh, income, health, those states are faring much worse than the states that One have. One quick question, because we are short on time. Some artists set up a shrine for Derrick Rose to come back. Uh, crutches, candles, flowers. Hopefully his knee will heal and he'll be back in time for the playoffs. We'll go through quickly. Hermine, sweet or sad? <laughs> Very sad. James. I think, you know, this is part of the, the gap in sort of civic involvement. People just need to find other ways to fulfill their lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta love Chicago sports fans, but I mean, a crown of thorns, really. He hasn't brought home a championship, let alone died for our sins. So. Yeah. <laughs> we will leave it at that. Hermine Hartman, James Tindwa, Kathleen Murphy, we thank you.